R plus L equals J. In a way, it's the first A Song of Ice and Fire theory, and the first big mystery. But of course, the question, who is Jon Snow's mother, turns out to be a trick question, because Ned isn't his father. That's right. Spoiler, spoiler alert, spoilers all. Ned turns out to be his uncle, because of course, Jon turns out to be the secret son of Lyanna Stark and Crown Prince Rhaegar Targaryen, both of whom died in the events surrounding Robert's Rebellion. This tragic series of events, known as Robert's Rebellion, although it's Not really Roberts, we'll get into that. Does form a large part of the backstory for the main story of Song of Ice and Fire. And although I do think the indications are that R plus L equals J was a love story, hence the title, many questions remain. For starters, Robert himself accuses Rhaegar of abducting Lyanna, of course, and even R-wording her. So how do we know that's not true? And what about Leanna being so young, only 16, when she died due to complications uh, related to Jon Snow's birth? What were Rhaegar's true motives, and what is his real character? And the same goes for Leanna. What were her motives, and what is her character? If it wasn't an abduction and they did run away together, why did they do it in such a way as to provoke a war, so to speak? And why did they then hide away from the rest of the kingdom for over a year and a half, while everything was falling into bloody war. What was Rhaegar and Lyanna's relationship like? Meaning, how much of it was about prophecy, how much about politics, and how much about matters of the heart? And also, how much more sad will all of this make John when he learns the truth? And will that truth merely tell John who his parents were, or actually make him a true-born Targaryen, and thus giving him a potential claim to the throne, in addition to one of Danny's dragons, which of course is the whole point of the prince that was promised prophecy. And how will John feel about being a part of this three-headed Azor High Reborn prince that was promised a dragon? The prince that was promised Thrupple, if you will. Now, I've never made an RLJ video before, so I'm very excited to give my take and Happy to say that I'm bringing some new observations and ideas to the table. That's right, I won't just be rehashing the old stuff. So make sure you're subscribed to the channel, and let's talk about the central romantic tragedy of A Song of Ice and Fire. Okay, well, I hope you didn't think you were doing an RLJ video without me. No, I definitely didn't think that. Here, move over. Let me handle this. Okay, but just remember what we talked about. Hello everyone, Reading Rhaegar here to address the lingering controversy surrounding my actions concerning Lyanna Stark and the tourney of Harrenhal. No, 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 I told you, you can't do that. Can't do what? Go ruining the story before George Martin tells it. Okay, but it's been like 12 years since he released the last book. You're the one who faked your own death and went into hiding in my apartment. Well, you're the one who told me to fake my own death. Rhaegar, that's insane. The timelines don't even match up. What? Now please just tell the people how you and Lyanna and Three Kingsguard survived so long at the Tower of Joy in the Isle of Faces without visiting nearby villages for food and getting found out. Oh, well, that's simple. Dave, we just had Magic Spoon delivered right to the Tower of Joy and to the Isle of Faces before that. Wow, Magic Spoon can deliver to the Isle of Faces? That's convenient. Yes, yes, it sure was. It was convenient. Uh, I mean, who wants to put on a fake disguise just to go to the supermarket? So pretentious. We just had Magic Spoon deliver some of their tasty, high-protein cereal and cereal bars. They come in so many delicious flavors. Let me guess. Leanna's favorite was the blueberry muffin. Well, of course it was, Dave. Of course. Although everyone loves the birthday cake and the double chocolate and the chocolate chip cookie. What about you, Rhaegar? What's your favorite flavor? Oh, well, I'm a fruity guy myself. (laughs) This is no laughing matter, Dave. Adults need snacks that are delicious and fueling, and Magic Spoon's cereal and treat bars are high in protein and contain less than one gram of sugar per serving. Now people can enjoy the taste of their childhood with grown-up ingredients and no artificial flavors or dyes. Oh yeah, I know I love Magic Spoon. That's why my viewers can use my code Lightbringer to get $5 off their order and build their own custom flavor box with all their favorite flavors. Well, there you have it, folks. You heard it from the man himself. So click the link below or scan the QR code in the corner. And don't forget the code Lightbringer for $5 off your very first order of Magic Spoon cereal and treat bars. Thanks, Rhaegar. You're welcome, Dave. And now can I please answer these vile calumnies? No, no, that's my job. Mm. I suppose the first question is, how do we know that R plus L equals J? There are still some holdouts, some deniers. God God bless you. The fandom's big enough for everyone. But yeah, how, how do we know? So I suppose the easy answer is that Famously, the question that George asked Dave and Dan when they were interviewing with George for 
the privilege of faithfully adapting Song of Ice and Fire to television. The question that he asked him, the penultimate interview question, was who is Jon Snow's mother? And presumably they got the right answer because they got the job, of course, and then they showed us R plus L equals J on the TV show. Now, I have seen it argued that they, you know, RLJ is the wrong answer and that George liked that they gave the wrong answer because he wanted the red herring answer to be on television and that's all a little convoluted for me, so... And I think this is really just too big of a thing to change, you know, but... And I also have to point out that the show barely used RLJ as a plot device. They pretty much used it exclusively to create political tension between John and Danny, but didn't mention it at all in the context of why John could ride the dragon, like, gee, oh, that's why Rhaegal liked you so much. You're a Targaryen, duh, of course. And the same goes for the whole prince that was promised Azor High Reborn thing, they didn't really do much with it. And they had Arya be the one to, you know, kill the Night King and neutralize the others just as a twist. So overall, it looks like the show did RLJ because they had to, not because they were excited to use it in a bunch of creative ways. What's most important, though, is that R plus L equals J is clear from the books. And that's actually why I treat it as settled law, quote unquote, not because of anything we saw on the show. I'll go ahead and lay out the classic central proofs for R plus L equals J, since it may be a while since you've heard them all put together. And as we go, we'll also begin to uncover the character and motivations of Rhaegar and Lyanna. The first classic proof, and my personal favorite, has to do with Blue Winter Roses, and it comes from Danny's House of the Undying Visions. A blue flower grew from a chink in a wall of ice and filled the air with sweetness. Mother of dragons, bride of fire... <clears throat> Excuse me, I had some <clears throat> undying ones in my, in my throat box there. Uh, yeah, so the blue flower growing out of the chink in the wall of ice really can only be interpreted as meaning that John is the son of Lyanna Stark, you know, and that he's growing to manhood, coming into bloom, if you will, at the wall. That's right, a, John's a special snowflake and a special flower. Now, the Blue Winter Rose, of course, is heavily and repeatedly associated with Lyanna Stark, such as when Ned recalls the tourney of Harrenhal and the moment when all the smiles died, when Prince Rhaegar Targaryen urged his horse past his own wife, the Dornish princess, Elia Martell, to lay the Queen of Beauty's laurel in Lyanna's lap. He could see it still, a crown of winter roses, blue as frost. Now, I'm a symbolism guy, of course, and this really is pretty straightforward. There's not much else this could mean other than some part of Lyanna is coming into bloom at the wall, which would obviously be John. And the fact that this is being shown to Danny is even more telling. Why, is, why does Danny need to see this? Well, the spirit world is trying to tell her about her long lost family, one of the other heads of the dragon, and potentially her future romantic partner. You'll notice that the Undying One's refrain after the bit about the blue rose growing out of the wall of ice is Mother of Dragons, Bride of Fire. John's body is dead and cold now, but not for long. Sooner or later, it's probably going to be powered by R'hllor, TM. And so, if Danny weds him or partners with him in any sense, then she would be wedding fire. She'd be the Bride of Fire, Yet again, because, of course, she also wed the fire in Khal Drogo's pyre when she hatched the dragons in a more symbolic sense. Now, in regards to the line about John the Blue Flower filling the air with sweetness at the wall, well, it gives us hope that some part of John connecting with his true identity as Lyanna's son will bring some grace to John and the world. And wouldn't that be nice? Blue winter roses come into bloom, wait for it, in the winter. And that's just when the world will need John to embrace his true nature as a special snowflake. Blue Winter Roses lead us to another of the best R plus L equals J clues, and that is, of course, the story of Bale the Bard and the Rose of Winterfell, which is told to John by Ygritte in A Clash of Kings. The story goes that Bale the Bard, a famous warrior bard and wildling king beyond the wall, climbed over the wall to teach a lesson to the Lord Stark of Winterfell, who had called Bale a craven who preyed only on the weak. So Bale came to prey on Lord Stark himself. Teach him a lesson. There you go. Bale disguised himself as a traveling minstrel and went to Winterfell. And this is, of course, the place where Mance Raider got the idea to do the very same thing, to disguise himself as Abel the Bard and sneak into Winterfell. So here is the passage. North or south, singers always find a ready welcome. So Bale ate at Lord Stark's own table and played for the Lord in his high seat until half the night was gone. The old songs he played and new ones he'd made himself. And he played and sang so well that when he was done, the Lord offered to let him name his own reward. 
All I ask is a flower, Bale answered, the fairest flower that blooms in the gardens of Winterfell. Now as it happened, the winter roses had only then come into bloom, and no flower is so rare nor precious. So the Stark sent to his glass gardens and commanded that the most beautiful of the winter roses be plucked for the singer's payment. And so it was done. But when morning come, the singer had vanished, and so had Lord Brandon's maiden daughter. Her bed they had found empty, but for the pale blue rose that Bale had left on the pillow where her head had lain. So here the blue rose is used as a clear and obvious stand-in for the Stark maiden who was abducted. The blue rose is even left where her head had lain, which reminds us of how Lyanna wore the blue rose crown on her head. Bale the Bard is a singer and lutist who is also a king, and Rhaegar is a singer and a harpist who is also a crown prince. So there you go, two abducted Stark maidens, blue winter roses used as a symbol both times, both of them stolen by singers, the parallels are pretty clear. However, we know, as it turns out, that this was no abduction, but rather a love story. They had been in Winterfell all the time, hiding with the dead beneath the castle. The maid loved Bale so dearly, she bore him a son, the song says. Though if truth be told, all the maids love Bale in them songs he wrote. Be that as it may, what's certain is that Bale left the child in payment for the rose he'd plucked unasked. And that boy grew to be the next Lord Stark. So there you go, it was a love story, and they were hiding out where no one could find them, so they could have a secret love child. Much like Rhaegar and Lyanna probably did. There's still a vague element of abduction in this story, since it's customary to ask the father of such an unwed maiden for her hand, that Bale didn't do that. That's why it refers to the rose plucked unasked. But you'll notice that the lack of consent is with not asking the father of the woman, not the woman herself, because... You know, hashtag patriarchy. Similarly, Rhaegar and Lyanna didn't get anyone's permission, of course, and Rhaegar was already married to Elia of Dorne, with whom he had two children, and Lyanna was betrothed to Robert Baratheon. So it's a similar scenario of forbidden love that had to be hidden. Also note the Romeo and Juliet vibes, Bale and his maiden are falling in love, but they are from two factions who are typically at war. And the same is true for Rhaegar and Lyanna. Their family members and friends kind of went to war all around them. Bale the Bard's story ends in tragedy because of that, and of course, so does Rhaegar and Lyanna's. Bringing it back to John himself, it's really lovely that this Romeo and Juliet-esque Bale the Bard love story is being told to John by Ygritte, because of course, John and Ygritte are their own Romeo and Juliet-esque forbidden love story between factions who are normally at war, which also ends in tragedy. Gosh, man, this stuff is compelling, isn't it? And of course, we notice the parallels here. Uh, Rhaegar fell in love with his northern girl, Lyanna, and then John too, fell in love with a northern girl in relation to him, because Ygritte is from north of the wall. So it's a terrifically poetic echo in a number of ways. John is unknowingly following in the steps of his dad while being told a story about someone else who parallels his dad. And then to help us put this all together, George Martin has Ned and Robert go down into the Winterfell crypts where Bale and his maiden hid out in order to tell us the story of Rhaegar and Lyanna. That way, later when we hear the story about them hiding out in the crypts, when we think of the crypts, we think of Lyanna and her statue down there and the way they talked about the whole story down there. Rhaegar and Lyanna are both together in the crypts or among the dead in the sense that they are both dead and they are both in the underworld. As I'm sure many of you know, Rhaegar and Lyanna are inspired in large part by the myth of Hades and Persephone. That's why the abduction of Lyanna is written to occur during the false spring, and why the weather immediately snaps viciously back into the cold winter right after she disappears, because that's how the Persephone and Demeter myth works. When Persephone is abducted, her mother, Demeter, who has power over the spring, is upset and stops the cycle of the seasons until she's brought back. And so that's why George wrote Bale and his maiden to have hidden down in the crypts, because they're like Hades and Persephone that way, hiding down in the underworld. Along the same lines, we also get Robert talking to Ned after, after the scene where he hit Cersei, gave her a black eye, blamed her for it, and then threatened her with another black eye if she told anyone. Classy guy, that Robert. We'll get into that, too. Yeah, so right after that, Robert says to Ned, Rhaegar. Rhaegar won, damn him. I killed him, Ned. I drove the spike right through that black armor into his black heart, and he died at my feet. They made up songs about it. Yet somehow, he still won. 
He has Leanna now, and I have her. Moving right along on our tour of R plus L definitely does equal J. We have the Ned Clues, which are some of my favorites. They just keep giving and giving. Honestly, I found some new ones just last week. So Ned was there at the Tower of Joy and spoke to Leanna as she died. So he knows the truth. And it's telling that the entire time Robert is ranting about the evil Targaryens and how he wants them all dead and all the horrible things that Rhaegar did to Leanna. How many times did he R-word her? It's really over the top. And that whole time, Ned never once agrees. In fact, he constantly deflects. And that continues all through the first book. Ned, in fact, still speaks passionately about the wrongness of the murder of Rhaegar's children. He does it several times in A Game of Thrones. And of course, he and Robert had a huge fight and stopped talking for a long time after Ned learned about the murder of Rhaegar's children. Then even after they were reconciled, after Lyanna's death, Ned peaced out and went north and didn't visit Robert again at all, except for that one time they had to throw down the Greyjoy Rebellion. So this obviously changed their friendship, and we also remember that in A Game of Thrones, Ned resigned his office as Hand of the King instead of sending assassins to kill Daenerys. So really, Ned Stark is just a protector of Targaryen children in general. In fact, Ned leaves King's Landing after learning of the murder of Rhaegar's first two children and goes straight to the Tower of Joy to protect and adopt Rhaegar's third child. Although, of course, probably thinking about Jon more as Lyanna's child than Rhaegar's, but there you have it. Ned Stark, protector of Targaryen children. Now, when Ned thinks to himself about what it was that got Lyanna killed, he doesn't think about Rhaegar. He thinks of Lyanna's boldness and impetuousness, saying, The wolf blood, my father used to call it. Lyanna had a touch of it, and my father Brandon more than a touch. It brought both of them to an early grave. Ned adds that Lyanna would have carried a sword if she had been allowed, which we'll come back to. Similarly, when Ned is investigating a secret bastard of King Robert, born to a sex worker in King's Landing, although I hesitate to call her a sex worker since she's so young that she can't consent to what she's doing, and therefore it's really more of a trafficking situation, but saving that conversation for another day, we're talking about the King's Landing sex worker who named her daughter Bera after Baratheon, after, after Robert, the one that's waiting for Robert to come and uh, love her, unfortunately. So when Ned is investigating this, he thinks to himself, For the first time in years, he found himself remembering Rhaegar Targaryen. He wondered if Rhaegar had frequented brothels. Somehow, he thought not. So Ned doesn't think of Rhaegar often. He's not obsessing over all the evil things that he did to his sister like Robert is. And when he does think about Rhaegar here, he thinks of him as having more restraint than Robert, specifically more sexual restraint, which is not something he would think if Rhaegar had abducted and R-worded his sister, obviously. If that were the case, then Ned's inner monologue might sound something more like, he wondered if Rhaegar Targaryen visited brothels. Somehow he thought not. Rhaegar Targaryen would just take what he wanted to as he had taken Lyanna. Forgive me for writing fan fiction, but you, you get the point. This is not a man with a grudge against Rhaegar. And in fact, you won't find a single ill word about Rhaegar in Ned's inner monologue or his outer monologue, which is called speech. But yeah, you won't find it. Why is that? Because Ned knows that R plus L equals J is a love story. I was with her when she died, Ned reminded the king. She wanted to come home to rest beside Brandon and father. He could hear her still at times. Promise me, she had cried, in a room that smelled of blood and roses. Promise me, Ned. The fever had taken her strength, and her voice had been faint as a whisper. But when he gave her his word, the fear had gone out of his sister's eyes. Ned remembered the way she had smiled then, how tightly her fingers had clutched at his as she gave up her hold on life, the rose petals spilling from her palm, dead and black. So you see why I wore my Deftones shirt. It's not just the blue flowers, this whole thing is a Deftones song. It's, it's emo as, you know, you know what. Because, I mean, folks, these, these are the same roses that Rhaegar gave her over a year and a half ago that she's clutching onto in a room so full of roses that the smell of roses cuts through the smell of blood. That means that Rhaegar has been bringing roses continually to Lyanna while they stayed there. So, yeah, this is a romance thing. Along the same lines as Lyanna dying with Rhaegar's roses in her hand, uh, Danny's second RLJ-related House of the Undying Vision, there's three total, by the way, shows us Rhaegar dying with what seems to be Lyanna's name on his lips. 
Rubies flew like drops of blood from the chest of a dying prince, and he sank to his knees in the water and with his last breath murmured a woman's name. Mother of dragons, daughter of death. I hope you all appreciate the sacrifices I go to 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 make this happen. I have to drink Gatorade of the evening just to get that undying voice. Boom. All right, so Danny was born not long after Rhaegar died amidst the fall of her entire house. So that's probably the meaning of daughter of death. And then as to what name it is that Rhaegar is murmuring as he dies, well, George has referred to Rhaegar as a love-struck prince. And we know that his marriage to Elia was political and that they were fond, but not in love. So this obviously must be Lyanna's name that he is murmuring as he dies. And once again, that's a love story thing. So now jumping back to the scene of the King's Landing Pleasure House... Uh, where Ned is holding the secret bastard of King Robert. It should be noted that the babe's pleas to Ned remind Ned of Leanna's pleas, and that immediately after he looks at the baby and thinks of Jon Snow. And at the risk of stating the obvious, that's to help us think that Jon Snow is a secret bastard of Leanna. And Ned even has an entire flashback of a conversation that he had with Leanna at Winterfell, which is some of the only Leanna dialogue we get in the entire story, and uh, we'll read that in just a second. But first, we have to do the final major R plus L equals J proof, and that would come from one of Bran's visions uh, in A Dance with Dragons, which comes while he's hopped up on Weirwood Paste, of course. Lord Eddard seemed much younger this time. His hair was brown, with no hint of gray in it, his head bowed. Let them grow up close as brothers, with only love between them, he prayed, and let my lady wife find it in her heart to forgive. So, what two boys who aren't actually brothers, but who are growing up together, would Ned be praying to love each other like brothers? Obviously, Rob and John. So, that doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. And then the bit about his lady wife forgiving him has to do with the fact that he is telling Kat that John is his, and thus creating a very tense dynamic in his family situation. So, this prayer, essentially... He's hoping that this desperate favor that he's doing for his sister won't tear his family apart. And for the most part, he was pretty successful at preventing that. John and the Trueborn Stark siblings did grow up as a pack, as you know, with a lot of love for each other. There's a little tension between Sansa and John, but still, it didn't threaten his house. Ultimately, it was the machinations of Peter Baelish and Lysa Tully, and then, you know, the Lannisters, Cersei Lannister, that brought down Ned, not this secret of John's identity. We'll also note that A Dance with Dragons ends with John trying to go desperately to Winterfell to rescue who he thinks is Arya from Ramsay Bolton. So the pack is still sticking together or trying to. And overall, we can see that Ned's example of an honorable life is something of a moral compass, a North Star for all the kids. They've all got what would Ned do armbands, if, if you know what I'm talking about. That's important as all the Starks navigate the moral challenges of the story. And although it is very tragic what happened to Rhaegar and Lyanna, and we'll never know what kind of parents they would have been if they had lived and how the Thrupple family would have worked, it's probably not a bad thing that Ned Stark was the one to raise one of the princes that was promised, right? Now, there are more RLJ proofs, of course, like this new calendar art from Justin Sweet from the 2024 calendar showing Rhaegar and Lyanna on the Isle of Faces. It's definitely a strange place to take someone if you're kidnapping them, but more likely they went there for some magical purpose, maybe a secret wedding. And many people have also noticed that the same calendar that shows us Rhaegar and Lyanna doing wedding-type things on the Isle of Faces, also gives us this amazing art of Bale the Bard and the Rose of Winterfell, which, as we mentioned, is a story written specifically to parallel Rhaegar and Lyanna and to give us clues that they are Jon's parents. So, now that we've got that out of the way, there's no more RLJ deniers. They've all been converted with love and sound logic. You're welcome, fandom. You're welcome. Let's go ahead and move on to trying to figure out what actually happened. And yes, I know there will still be deniers, but if you're going to comment, then you need to tell me what that blue rose in the chink in the wall of ice means, if it doesn't mean that John is Leanna's son. I'm all ears. I've just never heard any other convincing explanation. Let's move on to the next section. 
All right, so our first clue about what actually happened comes from that conversation between Ned and Leanna that we referred to a moment ago. This scene would have occurred sometime not long before everyone went to the tourney of Heron Hall, so probably when Leanna was around 13 or 14. Robert will never keep to one bed. Leanna had told him at Winterfell on the night long ago when their father had promised her hand to the young Lord of Storm's End. I hear he's gotten a child on some girl in the Vale. Ned had held the babe in his arms. He could scarcely deny her, nor would he lie to his sister. But he had assured her that what Robert did before their betrothal was of no matter, that he was a good man and true, who would love her with all his heart. Leanna had only smiled. Love is sweet, dearest Ned, but it cannot change a man's nature. So, of course, what's striking here is Leanna's perceptiveness. She's gently lecturing her older brother on the nature of men, their vices, and love itself. And she's quite right. She's right on the money, even though she's very young. She seems to already understand the basics of the world, you know, about how there are men like Robert who exist, who are slaves to their appetites, and how it's basically foolish to ever expect anything different from them. Leanna also already has a good ear for information, it seems. She already knows about Maya Stone in the veil on the day that she's betrothed to Robert. Now, I'm not saying she's Lord Varys with a network of informants, but... She's not ignorant either. Most notably, Leanna doesn't seem thrilled about marrying Robert, even though he's Ned's best friend, probably because of her perceptiveness and her ear for information. And this could obviously be a huge factor in her decision-making. Before we even get into any questions of prophecy in the prince that was promised, we should observe that Leanna choosing to flee with Rhaegar is also a choice to flee her marriage to Robert who, by the way, was busy getting into drinking contests at the same tourney where Rhaegar was singing sad songs that made the Wolf Maid weep, and also winning the tourney and naming the Wolf Maid Queen of Love and Beauty. It's really quite the contrast when you think about it. So all of you guys mad at Rhaegar, I do have to ask, why do you want her to marry Robert so bad? <laughs> I know that's not the whole point, but still. Now, in case you're wondering about everyone's ages at the tourney of Harrenhal, which was in late 281 AC, by the way, Lyanna is either 14 or 15, Ned is 18, Robert is 19, and Rhaegar is either 21 or 22. So try to think of someone that you knew who was already an aggressive alcoholic, the, the drinking contest kind of alcoholic, at the age of 19. It's not really a great harbinger of things to come. Usually that person is headed for a life of alcoholism or some sort of intervention or dramatic life event that causes dramatic change. So you can't really blame Leanna if, in part, she was fleeing her betrothal to Robert. And that's without even getting into the fact that Robert eventually physically abuses Cersei, like we talked about. Please don't think that Leanna would have stayed on that pedestal forever. That's, that's not how it works with people like Robert. Now, as most people realize, Robert never even really knew Leanna. Ned says that himself, so it's not really something you have to figure out. And if he's in love with anyone, it's an imaginary version of Leanna that he's been sort of romancing in his mind over the years. Robert can't even remember what Leanna looks like anymore, he confesses, which is really neither here nor there. But far more telling is the exchange he has with Ned in King's Landing when Ned was trying to talk him out of participating in the melee right after Cersei had been trying to talk him out of participating in the melee. The mirth curdled on Robert's face. The woman tried to forbid me to fight in the melee. She's sulking in the castle now, damn her. Your sister never would have shamed me like that. You never knew Leanna as I did, Robert, Ned told him. You saw her beauty, but not the iron underneath. She would have told you that you have no business in the melee. There's just so much character work going on here. I love scenes like this. So first of all, Robert is accusing Cersei of sulking in the castle. He's the one sulking right here to Ned. She, she tried to forbid me. Leanna would never would have done this to me. Hmm. And then, as we said, Robert doesn't even really know Leanna. And Leanna is established here by Ned as someone with the wolf blood. And apparently the wolf blood sometimes means telling truth to power. So Ned's saying, yeah... Leanna wouldn't have taken any of your crap. She would have told you you had no business in the melee also. So here again, I will say that if Robert, even if he had gotten his dream and married Leanna, he eventually would have lost his temper with her too, because she obviously wouldn't be suffering his BS in silence either. So we see more of what it means for Leanna to have the wolf blood, of course, in the story of the Night of the Laughing Tree. That one begins with Leanna beating up three bully squires in defense of Howland Reed. So that's pretty awesome. They shoved him down every time he tried to rise, and kicked him when he curled up on the ground. But then they heard a roar. 
That's my father's man you're kicking, howled the she-wolf. The she-wolf laid into the squires with a tourney sword, scattering them all. The Krenog man was bruised and bloodied, so she took him back to her lair to clean his cuts and bind them up with linen. But then they heard a roar. That's pretty much the stuff of legends right there, the stuff of heroes. And of course, standing up to bullies is basically story code for this person is a hero. And in fact, it's no coincidence that 17 or 18 years later, or whatever it is, we could find Leanna's son John at the wall, standing up to bullies too. And again, it's three against one. And that's when he's defending Sam in the training yard. And not only is John standing up to the bullies in that scene, he's also standing up to Sir Alistair Thorne, who, of course, has power over John and has the ability to make John's life miserable. So, just like his mom, John is someone who will stand up for what is right, even if it means confronting someone with power over him. Now, if you remember, a few years ago, there was a lot of discussion in fandom circles about uh, Mary Sue's, right? Ray from Star Wars, how did she learn to do this or that? She didn't go to combat school and all that stuff, right? So, how does a teenage girl with a stick beat up three squires who are like 15 years old and that thus, you know, the same age as Leanna. Well, recall the line from Ned that talks about Leanna would have carried a sword if her father had allowed it. How does Ned know that her father wouldn't allow it? Did Leanna try to carry a sword? Yeah, she must have. And of course, another of Bran's visions shows us Leanna training with a kind of wooden sword in the Winterfell Godswood with her younger brother, Benjamin. Now two children danced across the godswood, hooting at one another as they dueled with broken branches. The girl was the older and taller of the two. Arya, Bran thought eagerly as he watched her leap up onto a rock and cut at the boy. But that couldn't be right. If the girl was Arya, the boy was Bran himself, and he had never worn his hair so long. And Arya had never beat me playing swords the way that girl is beating him. She slashed the boy across his thigh so hard that his leg went out from under him, and he fell into the pool and began to splash and shout. You be quiet, stupid, the girl said, tossing her own branch aside. It's just water. Do you want old Nan to hear and run tell father? She knelt and pulled her brother from the pool, but before she got him out again, the two of them were gone. Aha, so Leanna's the real bully. Hypocrite. I kid, of course. She's probably giving Benjen the same sort of training, sword training, that uh, her older brother, Brandon, probably gave to her. That's right. Because I'm pretty sure that's where this all got started. We know that Brandon had a bold and rash nature, and we know that Brandon and Leanna went horseback riding all over the north. So one imagines that Brandon was probably the ringleader in giving Leanna the secret sword training. And you'll note that in the scene we just read, Leanna is talking about not letting old Nan hear because she'll tell Father Rickard. So yeah, this is Forbidden sword training. Regarding the famous horseback riding of Brandon and Leanna, it is of course said that they are very gifted and natural horse riders. Half centaur, which doesn't make sense because a centaur is half person already, as we always like to say. But that is nevertheless the key to understanding how Leanna was able to enter the tourney at Harrenhal as a mystery knight put on some armor, and defeat three real knights. None other than Jamie Lannister tells us, while watching Sir Loras joust, that jousting was three-quarters horsemanship. And of course, we see that on display as Loras is able to defeat Sir Gregor and basically anyone else he comes up against, even though he is 17, and described as slender. And then there's one other final piece of the Knight of the Laughing Tree puzzle, and that comes from Brienne of Tarth, who similarly whooped up on the boys at a major tourney. So before Brienne removes her helm, she speaks, and her voice, muffled inside the helm, is not recognizable as a female voice. So this is how Lyanna was able to give her little speech after defeating the three knights at the tourney. She never took off her helm, and her voice, it says, it boomed inside the helm, and no one could then tell that it was a girl. Now, after Lyanna, dressed as the mystery knight with the weirwood shield, had defeated the three knights, she famously left her shield hanging from a tree branch and made it appear as though the mystery knight had vanished. This enraged King Ares, who felt the mystery knight had humiliated him, and so he demanded the mystery knight be unmasked, and he sent out many knights to accomplish that task, including his son Rhaegar. Now, the official story goes that no one was able to discover the identity of the Knight of the Laughing Tree. And then four days later, Rhaegar wins the tourney and mysteriously names Lyanna the Queen of Love and Beauty. So it's pretty easy to fill in the gaps here, right? Rhaegar must have found Lyanna when he was looking for the Knight of the Laughing Tree. And instead of turning her in to his pyromaniac and insane father, he 
fell in love with her. Or at least they must have begun their romance, let's say. Rhaegar would no doubt have been impressed by Lyanna's boldness and her jousting skill in addition to her beauty. And most likely he would have gotten the entire story about the bully squires and how Lyanna stood up to them and then entered the tourney to teach them a lesson and then been further impressed by Lyanna's bravery and audacity. Lyanna must have seemed like Artemis herself, the warrior and the maiden, come to life as one. All right, so now it's time to talk about the big issue of prophecy. We know this is a big part of the RLJ equation, and it seems likely that prophecy would have been discussed here in these secret meetings between Rhaegar and Lyanna at Harrenhal. And specifically, we're talking about Aegon's prophecy of ice and fire, which we saw on the show, and which we know some version of exists in the books as well. That prophecy speaks of the prince that was promised having a song of ice and fire, and we know that Rhaegar learned of Aegon's prophecy based on the things he was saying in Danny's vision of him in the House of the Undying, which, by the way, is Danny's third RLJ-related House of the Undying vision. Rhaegar flat out says that the prince that was promised has a song of ice and fire, and Three Heads has the dragon. So, some combination of Rhaegar's interpretation of Aegon's prophecy and other prophecies, and possibly prophetic dreams that Rhaegar had himself, and possibly some stuff Halland Reed might have been saying after coming back from the Isle of Faces. More on that in the next RLJ video next month. So some combination of all those things must have led Rhaegar to believe that Lyanna was the right person to be the mother of the third head of the dragon and potentially the prince that was promised. Perhaps when the full version of Aegon's prophecy is revealed in the books, there'll be something about a wolf maid or winter roses or something like that. But I think it makes a lot more sense actually to speculate that Rhaegar had a dream at Harrenhal that referred to Lyanna in some cryptic way that he probably only put together after unmasking her as Knight of the Laughing Tree. Perhaps he dreamed of a weirwood warrior or of a she-wolf, like a literal wolf, you know, of fighting three knights or something like that. Something that only would have clicked after he discovered that it was Lyanna who was the Knight of the Laughing Tree. That creates this dramatic moment, this dramatic reveal, and it begins their relationship with the prophecy of the prince that was promised, which makes a lot of sense to me. Because somehow, these two young people who only had just met each other decided to act together very decisively in ways that obviously confuse the hell out of everyone else, to say the least. Something has to explain that kind of commitment and decisiveness, and I think prophecy is the only answer. So one way or the other, Rhaegar and Lyanna must have gained a shared understanding of their role in prophetic destiny and the end of the world. And this is the context in which we have to understand them as falling in love. And I want to emphasize that those two things are not exclusive at all. As I expect we'll see at the climax of the story with John and Danny. shared heroic destiny can be very romantic, and being bound together by fate can be very sexy. There potentially would have been multiple secret meetings between Rhaegar and Lyanna. And of course, George has said that the goings-on at Harrenhal could fill an entire novel. And of course, Rhaegar and Lyanna are right at the center of all that. Whatever plans that Rhaegar and Lyanna might have made to run away shortly after the tourney must have been made right here at the tourney, again, in secret. All right, so it may surprise you to learn, as it did me when I did this research, that there was actually over a year and a half, as much as a year and three quarters, between the time when Rhaegar and Lyanna absconded together and the time when Ned finds a dying Lyanna and a baby John at the Tower of Joy. I'll have a lot more to say about what might have went down during that time period in my next video, R plus L equals J, A Secret Wedding. And we'll start by figuring out what these two were doing here on the Isle of Faces. I do think it is a secret wedding, of course, but you don't just go to the Isle of Faces to get married, so, yeah, we gotta talk about that. What we can say for now in terms of their relationship is that it began at Harrenhal, and that it involved mutual respect, romance, and prophecy, all mixed up in one. And we can also observe that they then had a fair amount of time to develop both their relationship and their understanding of prophecy before they ever conceived Baby John or went to the Tower of Joy. All right, so now we understand that R plus L does equal J and that it was a love story, one driven by mutual admiration, destiny, and circumstance. And let me be clear, by circumstance, I mean the fact that Lyanna was engaged to a drunken womanizer and the fact that Rhaegar was the son of an insane pyromaniac. And then there was the small fact that the rebellion that was brewing against Rhaegar's father, the said mad insom insomniac, although probably Ares didn't sleep that well. <laughs> Anyways, 
Rhaegar's father was an insane... Oh. And then there was also the fact that uh, the rebellion brewing against Rhaegar's father, King Aerys, was spearheaded by Lyanna's dad, Rickard, and Robert's dad, Stephen Baratheon. So yeah, although it may be tempting to blame Lyanna and Rhaegar for running off and starting a war, as the pro-Robert maesters writing The World of Ice and Fire definitely do, it's very clear that some version of the Southron ambitions theory, as explained by Barbary Dustin to Theon and to We the Reader in The Crypts of Winterfell, is true. And of course, that is simply the theory that Rickard Stark, Hoster Tully, John Arryn, and Stephen Baratheon and maybe Tywin Lannister, were all plotting to supplant Mad King Ares, simply because of Ares' cruelty and misrule. Now, Rhaegar himself, to his credit, and please do remember that he's only like 21 or 22 as all this is going down, seems to also have been making some kind of preparations to depose his father peacefully, based on his saying to Jaime that changes will be made when he returns from the Battle of the Trident, which, of course, he never did. And then there's the role that Peter Baelish played in starting the war. I recommend watching In Deep Geek's video on this, but yes, it seems that Peter Baelish is the one who gave Brandon the mistaken idea that Rhaegar had abducted Lyanna, which led to Brandon rashly going to King's Landing and demanding that Rhaegar come out and die. And that, of course, led to Ares burning Brandon and Rickard. But even still, Brandon and Ares' rash and violent actions were really just the spark that set off the tinderbox, not the entire reason why the war happened. So like any war, it wasn't just one thing that started it. And somebody should tell that to the people on Twitter, the House of the Dragon fans trying to... Now, when Rhaegar and Lyanna disappeared, they surely knew that it would cause controversy. That's why they hid from everyone. But they really had no way of knowing that Littlefinger would deceive Brandon. And then, you know, the no way of knowing what Brandon would do. And no way of knowing how the rest of it would fall out. And really no way of knowing that it would go so far as to starting a war. And remember that John Aaron, Ned, and Robert didn't declare war on the Targaryen dynasty until after King Aerys had burned and tortured Rickard and Brandon, and then also demanded the heads of Ned and Robert from John Aaron, because they were in the Vale under his care at the time. So there was a long series of events that had to happen before the actual war happened, and overall the circumstances that led to war had already been brewing long before Rhaegar and Lyanna ever met. Ares' insanity, cruelty, and paranoia had already been happening, and the plotting against him, you're not, you're not paranoid if it's true, uh, the plotting against him had already been happening for years too. Because of course, remember, Lyanna's betrothal to Robert and Brandon's betrothal to Catelyn Tully were part of the alliance building of the Southron Ambitions conspiracy. So yeah, the bottom line is, I don't think it's fair to pin the start of the war on Rhaegar and Lyanna. A lot else had to happen. And even more than that, we know that at the very top of their priority list, of course, was conceiving the prince that was promised, which is understandable because we know that they were right, that they did conceive, you know, one of the princes that was promised. Obviously, Daenerys is one too. And yeah, we need John, the special snowflake, to save the world. So yeah, they weren't crazy or anything. So yeah, they really did kind of have to stay hidden from everyone to make sure that John was conceived without interference. And obviously there's a lot of missing information still. So in a way, we're kind of reserving judgment on Rhaegar and Lyanna's decision making until we have the full story. But for myself, I do begin with a fair amount of sympathy for both these characters, simply because we know this is a world where magic is real, where prophecy is real, where dragons and others and long nights are real. And we also know that even though prophecy is real, it's very hard to interpret correctly. So what we have here are two young people doing their best uh, with the understanding that they are partly responsible for the fate of the world. And they're doing their best to interpret the signs, ancient prophecies, dreams, a bleeding star, whatever Howland Reed told them from the, uh, you know, from the green men on the Isle of Faces. And yeah, taking on this incredible responsibility, this incredible weight of the fate of the world. So we, we have to sympathize with that. And of course, I will go into a lot more detail about Rhaegar and Lyanna's understanding of prophecy. And again, how their visit to the Isle of Faces may have affected that, because it seems like it might have. We already talked about why Lyanna is incredibly sympathetic, besides the fact that she's standing up to bullies. She's fleeing betrothal to somebody that, you know, nobody would really want to marry. 
And I think we can also sympathize with Rhaegar individually if we stop and put ourselves in his shoes. So right as you're coming of age, you know, ages 16 to 21 approximately, you're coming to grips with the weight of this prophetic destiny that you're coming to understand. And you're also coming to terms with the fact that your father is a terrible and cruel monarch and that Something simply has to be done about his misrule, and it might be up to you. It's pretty hard to blame Rhaegar for not already having supplanted Ares by the age of 22, and I think he does deserve credit for whatever plans he was making to do that. And he must have really felt caught in a vice when he started falling in love with the Knight of the Laughing Tree, whom his father wanted unmasked and, again, probably burned alive. And then how awful a moment it must have been for Rhaegar and Lyanna to hear about everything that fell out after they ran away. You know, Brandon's rush to King's Landing, Rhaegar's father torturing and murdering Lyanna's father and brother, Robert Baratheon and Ned going to war. I mean, wow. That was, talk about dark wings, dark words, or maybe they didn't find out until Gerald Hightower arrived at the Tower of Joy. But whenever they found out, that really must have been an awful awful moment and several days they must have felt incredibly guilty partially responsible and just awful i mean it's just so tragic now if you're looking for a longer discussion of liana including a long discussion of her age and agency then check out the liana stark live stream that we did it's one of my favorite discussion streams that i've done because again liana is one of my favorite characters i don't know if i said that already but she definitely is and disclosure i was not bullied really, but picked on a little bit in elementary school, enough to really relate to this. And if you were ever picked on, a lot of you nerds in the audience maybe had a little experience with bullying. And it's like, wouldn't it be nice to have a Jon Snow or a She-Wolf, a Lyanna Stark, show up and drive the bullies away and pick you up and take you into their tent? I mean, it's it's it connects with me on a personal level. But in any case, obviously, Lyanna's age and agency is a big thing to discuss with her. She is very young. And Westerosi society, all we're talking about this with Danny and Arya and Sansa and all these characters, right? So as you've seen so far in the video, I do think Lyanna is a character that's written to have a lot of agency. From her disciplining of the bullies, to her perceptiveness and her courage and boldness, to her choice to opt out of the marriage that her father arranged for her, to the descriptions of her that Ned gives us. Obviously, this is all set against the backdrop of quasi-medieval Westerosi society where teenagers are married off way too young and where essentially all the High Lords are using their children as political bargaining chips in the Game of Thrones. It's important to realize Lyanna was just such a chip offered to Robert Baratheon and House Baratheon as part of the alliance building to put this conspiracy to replace Ares together. So yeah, it would have been nice for Lyanna Stark or Sansa or Daenerys or any of these characters to have a teenage, a teenagerhood, whatever you call it, uh, without being forced to make these life-altering choices, right? Nevertheless, the moment arrived, Lyanna sensed the moment, and she did make a choice, and she chose to zag. She chose a different path than the one laid out for her by Rickard and her family. So again, obviously none of us reading the story think it's great that princes are marrying 15-year-olds and getting them pregnant. That's, that's, I hope that's obvious. But I really don't see any ill intent on Rhaegar's part. When we remember that that sort of age gap is basically normalized by societal custom, I just don't think that George is trying to write a predatory intent into his character. I guess everyone can interpret it the way they want to, but yeah, that's the way I see it. And if anything, it seems like we should be more mad at somebody like Robert or somebody like Rickard for betrothing Lyanna to Robert, as opposed to Rhaegar, who helped Lyanna make the choice that she wanted to make, which was getting out of the marriage with Robert. All right, next up on the Rhaegar Targaryen defense apology tour, and I swear, (laughs) it's not just because he's my roommate. Um, yeah, I'm really am trying to just analyze the story that George is writing here. But yes, next up on the defense tour, what about Elia of Dorne? Rhaegar was married. He had two kids with Elia. So what about that? Suffice it to say that I strongly feel that it is very unlikely that Rhaegar would have annulled his marriage to Elia for several reasons. One, the Targaryens practice polygamous marriage. Not often, but they have. Aegon the Conqueror obviously having two 
sister wives. Two, the Dornish are a lot more open-minded than most about sex and relationship arrangements, as we've seen. So Elia and the Dornish contingent, if you will, may have been okay with a polygamous marriage as long as Elia and her children retain their rights. And three, Rhaegar considered his two children with Elia, the other two heads of the dragon. So why would he want to disinherit them and remove their status? I think it's very telling and important that Danny's House of the Undying Vision also shows us Rhaegar consulting with Elia about his understanding of the prince that was promised prophecy, the three heads of the dragon, and the Song of Ice and Fire. So it seems very unlikely that she would be suddenly left out in the dark about Rhaegar's decision-making. She's obviously very much in the loop. We know the Maesters had clearly said Elia wouldn't be able to have another child after Aegon and Rhaenys. And Rhaegar is sitting right there in Danny's vision saying, three heads of the dragon, there must be one more. So again, I'd say it's far more likely that Elia knows what's up and probably knew what Rhaegar and Lyanna were about at the tourney at Harrenhal. You'll notice the story about when all the smiles died. There's, we get everyone's reaction except Elia. They doesn't say anything about Elia storming out or crying or anything like that. And even more telling is that Oberyn Martell, Doran Martell, and the Sand Snakes all of whom are obsessed with vengeance for Elia, none of them have a bad word to say about Rhaegar or any of the Targaryens. And in fact, Doran has been trying to marry his kids to Rhaegar's family for the past 18 years. And so, much like Ned, we can say that the Dornish don't seem to hate Rhaegar or really hold him responsible for any of the tragedy that fell out uh, from Robert's Rebellion. All right, so now let's go visit the Tower of Joy and see if we can answer any lingering questions, because there definitely are a few. The biggest mystery has always been, what are the Kingsguard doing there? And what's their rationale for seemingly just waiting around for someone to find them so they could die in a cause that had long since been defeated? What were their orders exactly that compelled them to do this? Well, one of the biggest things that jumped out to me when I was doing research for this video is that there is a big difference in the three Kingsguard at the Tower of Joy. They seem like a united front, but in fact, Arthur Dane and Oswell Went had been with Rhaegar the whole time, the entire time from when Lyanna and Rhaegar disappeared after the tyranny of Harrenhal to this moment when Ned finds them at the Tower of Joy. They were Rhaegar's best buds, and yeah, they were with him everywhere. If they went to the Isle of Faces, they either went with them or just waited on the shore for them to get back. I don't know, but they were with Rhaegar. However, not so for Sir Gerald Hightower, whom I have to confess I do not like. Yeah, Gerald Hightower, Lord Commander of the Kingsguard, he was sent to the Tower of Joy by Ares to haul Rhaegar back to King's Landing to fight the war. And then apparently he stayed for some reason at the Tower of Joy, while Rhaegar went back to fight the war. I've never really heard anyone make a big deal out of this before. I'm sure someone has somewhere, but yeah, it's new to me. Maybe it's new to you. And I think this difference between the background of these three Kingsguard might be the key to unraveling the mystery here. So for starters, Arthur Dane and Oswell Went would have been privy to any plans that Rhaegar would have been making to depose King Aerys, whom Arthur and Oswell hadn't seen since the tourney of Harrenhal. Went and Dane, therefore, would have been effectively under the orders of Rhaegar, at least until Sir Gerald Hightower showed up, potentially with different orders from King Aerys. And it certainly seems possible, or even likely, that there was a difference in interests between Rhaegar and Ares. So whatever Rhaegar and Arthur and Oswell thought they were up to at the Tower of Joy, everything may have changed the moment that Gerald Hightower showed up. We know that Rhaegar did leave the Tower of Joy to go fight the war that he previously had been ignoring, or potentially hadn't heard about until that point. So perhaps Rhaegar felt he had to wait at the Tower of Joy long enough for Lyanna to safely be pregnant, maybe showing a little bit, or perhaps he was going to wait there longer, but was compelled to leave by Gerald Hightower carrying an order from Ares. We can safely assume that Rhaegar did plan to return to the Tower of Joy. He just got killed, you know, and couldn't. But the question I have is, what is the conversation like between Rhaegar and Gerald Hightower and Arthur and Oswell when Gerald shows up to the Tower of Joy? I'm wondering, did Sir Gerald think about himself as protecting Lyanna at the Tower of Joy, or was it more like holding her hostage against Rhaegar's compliance? 
After all, Ares did keep Elia and her children in King's Landing when he had sent Rayella and Viserys over to Dragonstone for safety. And he did this specifically because he didn't trust the Dornish or Rhaegar. So there is a precedent of Ares holding Rhaegar's wives and children hostage against his compliance. And thus, it's not a big leap to speculate that King Ares ordered Sir Gerald to hold Lyanna hostage there until Rhaegar was finished fighting the war. This could explain why they chose to fight to the death instead of just letting Ned see his sister, right? If it had just been Arthur and Oswell there, they would have been more aligned with Rhaegar's priorities, and thus Lyanna's. And they would have known from hanging out with Lyanna all these months that Ned isn't a threat to her or her child, and conversely, was one of the few people in the world that they could actually trust to keep John safe. What I think happened is something more like Sir Gerald Hightower forcing the other two Kingsguard to fight to the death. Because Gerald Hightower probably wouldn't give a flying you-know-what about Rhaegar's interpretation of prophecy or any of that stuff. Hightower is carrying out Ares' orders and agenda. And in that context, Ned is just another sworn enemy. Whereas Arthur Dane and Oswell Went would have understood the stark Targaryen alliance that Rhaegar and Lyanna were trying to build and which was necessary to save the world. One assumes if they were Rhaegar's friends, they probably shared his belief in prophecy too, or else they were just following him around going, man, this guy's crazy, you better keep an eye on him. It's also worth noting that neither King Aerys nor Sir Gerald would have expected there to be a Targaryen prince or princess at the Tower of Joy, or at least, I guess, a woman pregnant with a potential Targaryen prince or princess. And so this may have forced a change in plans once Sir Gerald arrived, because of course the Kingsguard are sworn to protect the royal family. So I guess I could have said this a minute ago, but the obvious beginning of the answer to what are the Kingsguard even doing at the Tower of Joy is that Rhaegar must have married Lyanna, and therefore, when she's pregnant and Hightower shows up, that that is an official Targaryen baby on the way. Otherwise, it makes absolutely no sense for the Kingsguard to be at the Tower of Joy. And it especially makes no sense for them to fight to the death while talking about their sacred oaths that they can never, ever break. So yeah, based on that fact alone, it does seem that Rhaegar and Lyanna did get married. No doubt on the Isle of Faces, but we'll take a look at that in the next video. Now, one reason that leaps to mind as far as why didn't the Kingsguard go to the Trident to help Rhaegar fight is that it may have been too dangerous to move Lyanna from the Tower of Joy to King's Landing in the middle of a war, both because there's a war and because she's pregnant, and at a certain point it may not have been safe for her to travel. There could have also been the thinking that during a war, when Ares and the other various Targaryen princes and princelings are in danger, it wasn't a bad idea to have a different Targaryen prince or princess somewhere else secreted away, safely guarded by some Kingsguard. Or it could be that the deciding factor was that Rhaegar simply didn't trust King Ares with a pregnant Lyanna. I mean, that, that does seem likely. And perhaps he was able to sort of negotiate or bargain with Sir Gerald and get him to stay at the Tower of Joy with Arthur and Oswell to guard Lyanna in return for his compliance in returning to King's Landing to fight the war. Rhaegar may have been able to just order Gerald to stay there, or again, there may have been a negotiation. Or perhaps it is more hostile, like I said, with Gerald on direct order from Ares essentially holding Lyanna hostage against Rhaegar's compliance. And maybe Rhaegar then has Arthur and Oswell stay there because he doesn't trust Sir Gerald with Lyanna. So we can't say exactly what the truth is here, but there is some kind of messy, tangled, conflict of interest situation going on. So I'd love to hear your thoughts, and I've tried to take this as far as I can and reasonably speculate on how this difference uh, in the background of the three Kingsguard that are there could affect the situation. But yeah, let me know what you think, if you've got any good observations or ideas that I didn't think of, and maybe we can push this thing a little further. I hope I've laid out a good sketch of what R plus L equals J is all about, and why we can be sure that it was a love story. And I really can't wait to bring you my secret wedding theory, because it's a lot more than just... Rhaegar and Lyanna got married on the Isle of Faces. I mean, the old gods have been watching House Targaryen and taking a hand in the matters of the prince that was promised for several generations now. So seeing these two on the Isle of Faces and doing the math that they had months to stay there if they wanted to. Yeah, we got to talk about that. So look for that one in your YouTube feed next month. And actually before that, after this video and before that one, 
we'll have an even bigger video. And I do mean big. I've commissioned a very cool 3D art project from artist Chetan Biswas, who made this very cool Yin artwork that you may have seen in a few of my videos. And we have brought to life a very exciting part of A Song of Ice and Fire that we have seen very little of, and I can't wait to show you. I'm gonna keep it a surprise, but yeah, look out for a very big video from me a couple weeks after this one. So thanks for watching. Hit that thumbs up button on your way out. Subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you next time.